Hello, I'm Jeff Bennett, and this is Key Conversation. My guest today, Lori Singer, songwriter, worship leader, Jaron Davis. Jaron, welcome. Thank you for being with me. Thank you so much, man. It's a joy to be here. Jaron and his wife, Becky, are considered some of the premier writers of worship leaders in the church. Anyone in the music business certainly knows Jaron and Becky. And if you're not in the music business, you definitely know the music and the ministry of Jaron and Becky. They are multiple Dove Award winners, and they, along with their group Kindred Souls, have sung to millions of people around the world. Songs like Holy Ground, In the Presence of Jehovah, Mercy Saw Me, Holy of Holies, Evermore, Send It On Down, and I'm Gonna Make It are just a few of the hundreds of songs they've written. Their songs have also been recorded and performed by Barbara Streisand, the K through Vocal Band, Israel Houghton, Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, Michael W. Smith, Dolly Parton, Sandy Patty, The Hoppers, Christ Church Choir, and so many more. Jaron, though you have written and published and recorded hundreds of songs, I love that your passion is still to minister to the local church and to lead worship. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny, Jeff. Um, you can take a kid out of a pastor's home, but you can never take the pastor's heart out of that kid. And being a pastor's kid all my life, um, in college, I met a pastor's daughter and she became my wife. So uh, it has been sort of, we tell everybody, the pastor local church mindset is not what we do. It's who we are. It's in our DNA. Well, you've been doing this a long time. What is it that inspires you to keep writing new songs that are relevant and timely for the church today? How do you get your inspiration? Well, you know, it's funny. My wife and kids would tell you that's about all I'm good for. But um, in honesty, it's, it's the creative thing that God places in certain people. And um, when I see a bumper sticker or hear a phrase in a message or see a billboard or hear somebody say something um, on television. It, it triggers an idea and I start to see other things and I start to, um, I just start to write. And that's the way I process uh, things that are going on. And as you can imagine during the pandemic, um, you know, I heard a lot, saw a lot, thought a lot sat around a lot, uh, unfortunately ate a lot, but that's a, a whole nother uh, subject. But um, there were so many things that as I processed frustration, anxiety, hope, trust in the Lord, it all processed through songs. And uh, I'm excited about uh, getting to present some of those to people because I, I feel like we're just people. And so, you know, a person is a person is a person. We all share the same fears, hopes, dreams, and, and hopefully people will be able to identify and relate to it. You mentioned the pandemic. How much does our world situation and the political tension affect how and what you write musically over the last couple of years? Uh, did you sense that you had a new yearning, a new direction? Well, one of the things that I've always tried to do is keep my finger on the pulse of the church. Bill Gaither has a great saying that I uh, have quoted many times. He said, don't write songs that answer questions nobody's asking. Mm -hmm. And so I have always tried to address the needs, um, the hurts, uh, the hopes of church people and what they're going through to say things like, um, in his presence, there is joy beyond measure, and at his feet, peace of mind can still be found, or um, I'm going to make it. He's already said that I would. I'll keep trusting that he's working everything for my good, and so I think when you, when you look at the lives of people and the things they're going through, uh, writing to that um, and bringing the, the template of the word of God and the promises of God that are yea and amen. You bring all of that into juxtaposition. Um, it, it is hope. It says, you know, he knew I was going to be a mess um, before I was even born. That's why he said his mercies, plural, are new every single day. He knew I would mess up and stumble and fall enough times daily 
that he made accommodations for it. And he said that even in my weakness, he would be strong. And that's where our hope is. And I just try to say that in Lear. And we never outgrow the need to hear it. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I may be on the mountain today, but to get to the next mountain, I have to walk through a valley. And so the valleys are going to be just as regular as the mountains. And I wish, Jeff, that we could tell people that if you give your life to Jesus, we can guarantee you that your problems will all go away. Right. However, the one thing we have is when you have Jesus, he's your umbrella when it's raining. And that's what the hope of the Lord and the promises of his word are. They give us hope, even in rainy seasons, that he will not leave us. Let's talk a minute about Holy Ground. Long before Barbara Streisand recorded your song, Holy Ground, it was already a popular worship song and had been sung in worship services for quite some time at that point. Share with us what it was like when you first heard that she was going to sing and record that song. Well, it's kind of interesting, Jeff. Um, you know, I wrote Holy Ground when I was a teenager, and I wrote it in about 20, 25 minutes on a Saturday night for the first Sunday service in the new sanctuary that my dad pastored in the little town of Savannah, Tennessee. And dad had asked me about six weeks out to write a song, and we had a little band in our church, and me and my brother and a bunch of the guys in the church uh, had made a record, and we we just loved doing that. Uh, every every night we were doing something together, and so I had written some songs. So Dad said, "Write us a song." And like uh, most teenagers, and like most creatives, um, my motto was, "There's no minute like the last minute." And um, I put it off until Saturday night, and sat down and wrote it, and never imagining what would happen. And so when it began to catch on, and people started to hear it. It caught on in the church. It never really went to the charts. It never was a big song on radio, but it got caught, it caught on in the church. And Jack Hayford at his uh, pastor's conference said, if you only learn one song this year, let it be Holy Ground. And churches like Brooklyn Tabernacle and so many places started singing it and it just spread throughout the church. And um, when we found out that Streisand had um, recorded it, uh, it was a shock, but there was a precursor thing that happened that was a little um, unique. Uh, Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton, it, Holy Ground and In the Presence of Jehovah, two of his favorite songs, he had had us sing Holy Ground uh, and In the Presence at his inauguration, his first inauguration. And when his mother passed away, uh, it was one of her favorite songs, and he had it sung at her funeral. And I get a call from the White House that it's going to, uh, you know, that he had had it sung and how much it meant to him. And that, by the way, Barbara Streisand was there and that she um, had said it was one of the most powerful songs she had ever heard. But, Jeff, I got to be honest with you, man. I, you know, my mind was when the president of the United States asked you at his mother's funeral what you thought about his and the dead lady's favorite song. The right, the right answer is pat you on the shoulder and go powerful. A year later, we're at Brooklyn Tabernacle and Pastor Simla goes, you'll never believe who was in church a couple of weeks ago. Barbara Streisand was incognito, a scarf and glasses. And, you know, in, the, in that Brooklyn way he has of talking. I was like, wow, man, she heard the gospel. She, you right. know, never connected the dots. So three years after the funeral, the press release comes out. Becky calls me at the studio and says, Dan Keene from ASCAP uh, had called and said, you know, you're never going to believe this, but Barbara Streisand recorded your song. And, um, and he sent over the press release for, uh, from Columbia Records. And it talked about sitting at the funeral and hearing this song and, and how it electrified her and lifted her. And she knew then she had to sing that song. And the idea for that out for the entire album was, was born in that moment. It's kind of funny. We we found this out. The album came out in November. Becky said Jaron was thinking, think how many people are going to hear this. And and Becky said, to be honest with you, I was just thinking, wonder what I'll get for Christmas now. <laughs> but it was a stunning, powerful moment for somebody of the caliber of Barbara Streisand 
uh, who has, you know, Tonys and Emmys and Grammys and every kind of award you can imagine um, to be moved so powerfully by a song uh, and a lady of uh, the Jewish faith. I mean, she's, she's Jewish. Mm -hmm. And to hear a song that says, let us praise Jesus now. Wow. And to say it still moved her so much. And somebody said, how did it feel to know you electrified Barbara Streisand? And I said, I'm not crazy. I didn't electrify Barbara Streisand. Mm -hmm. But when you encounter the real rich presence of Almighty God, I don't care what you've done and what you've accomplished. Nothing compares to that, that moment being in his presence. But maybe for the first time she encountered the real rich presence of Almighty God. It's interesting, Jeff, that you said that the holy ground and in the presence of Jehovah are like a hymn. They, they actually have been in hymnals, which is, I thought you had to be dead or at least really, really old to be in a hymnal, <laughs> but uh, I've been in over a dozen of them. Our sweet friend, uh, who is a current worship music phenomenon, Charity Gale, mm -hmm. we were just with her, and on her latest album, she recorded um, Holy Ground. She said something like, uh, I will always do songs like Great is Thy Faithfulness and Holy Ground, which are the hymns that I grew up singing. Wow. And when I saw her recently, I said, uh, honey, I might be old, but I'm not great as thy faithfulness old. <laughs> but, you know, an interesting thing, Jeff, biblically, a generation is 40 years. Mm -hmm. I wrote Holy Ground 40 years ago. It turns 40 now. My goodness. And what's interesting is in its 40th anniversary, Charity Gale, a young new generation worship leader, Maverick City, a young current generation worship group, uh, Lakewood Worship, mm -hmm. uh, another young contemporary modern worship uh, group of singers have all recorded Holy Ground mm -hmm. and are singing it. And it's interesting to me that in a whole new generation, at the turn of the generational clock, uh, right. according to scripture, um, a new generation is singing that, which to me doesn't say, wow, what a great song you wrote. What that says to me is that the need for and the pre appreciation of the presence of God yeah. is always current. I don't care how old you are, how young you are. Uh, it's always something that your soul and spirit thirst and hungers for. And um, that's encouraging to me that that styles change, um, methods change, but the hunger and passion for his presence uh, remains consistent. Well, man, you are all over the place uh, singing concerts back on the road and on TV recently, the uh, TVN special. Tell us a little bit about what you're involved in now. What's, uh, what are you excited about? Well, I'm, I'm really excited about um, creating uh, new music. I, I'm in the process of um, three different projects right now and getting ready to release new music by the end of the year at the first of uh, next year. And uh, that, that's what we do. Our song typically fall into one of two categories. Either they give people things to say to God, or they say they give God things to say to people. So we try to tell people what we think the Lord wants to say to those people based on um, his word. And then you know, we give people words to say to God in, in uh, an expression of praise to him. And so that's what we're trying to do is just create new, fresh music uh, with the timeless message that uh, Jesus is the answer and uh, whatever you need can be found in his presence. And uh, I'm excited about all the new music. In your opinion, what are the non-negotiables uh, that must be included in music for corporate worship as you write. What, what are the, what's the ingredients, I guess, that cannot be left out uh, when you begin to craft a new song? You know, uh, there are several. Um, I, I typically, um, we, went, we went through a, a, a period of time where everybody focused on vertical. You know, it's got to be vertical. It's got to be vertical. 
he wants us, according to the understanding I have of scripture, first and foremost, to acknowledge that he is, to praise and, and to glorify and lift him up. But then he wants us to take what he has done for us and what he has, um, the, the miracles he's wrought in our life, mm -hmm. the, the places he's gotten us through. He wants us to turn around and share that with others. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're made overcomers through two things. Uh, the blood of the lamb, that's the vertical. And then the word of our testimony. And we went through a season where we really didn't do any testimony songs. For a time, that's all there were. Right. Then we went through a time where all there were were, you know, vertical songs. I think trying to find the balance is a good thing where we spend plenty of time worshiping and exalting him. But we also turn around and say, I don't care what you're going through. Right. I'm going to make it. You're going to make it. And, uh, you know, I don't care how dark the night is. There's a new day coming yeah. and, and God's going to get you through it. And so for me, the, the non-negotiable, the non-negotiables are it has to be theologically sound and it has to be current and relevant, but it also has to be a source of either praise and worship to him or inspiration and hope to my fellow believers. That's good. There's still this great divide of contemporary versus blended or traditional. And as you've just alluded to, it's it's choosing music and writing music that sings to the attributes of God, his power, his lordship, and also singing music to God. Lord, we are grateful. We are thankful. Uh, we need you to intervene and move among us. And, and, and music and songs that we are expressing our thanksgiving uh, to God for right. what he has done and for his redemption in our lives. And as you mentioned at the top of this interview, in faith, what he we know uh, he is going to do. And I think that, right. that combination of all of those elements uh, are so important. My feeling about from a music standpoint, because that's that's where that's the area I land in, is I've got people from teenagers to 110 and everything in between. So my goal is not to sing my favorite stuff, but to minister to and try to meet the needs of the people in the pew all across the board doesn't mean I can do all of it in one Sunday, but as a, as a worship pastor, um, somebody who is trying to weekly minister to the needs of people, I want to keep all those factors in mind and make sure that the young people know if I do a song that their grandmother loves, just hang on. That's right. We'll do one that, that you're going to love in a minute. And your grandma's going to be sitting over there with her fingers in her ears. But, but once we understand that, you know, I, I think the greatest thing Christians can ever learn is we don't have to be twins to be brothers. But if I can tolerate what I don't like because I know somebody else is being ministered to, that's, right. that's when I become selfless. And that's when the needs of others takes priority in my life. And we have gotten a little bit boutique and candy stick oriented in the body of Christ. And we want what we want and we want it when we want it. But really to understand that we're to be considerate of others is, uh, I think, what, what meets the, the call of the heart of God. You and Becky travel and perform with Kindred Souls. And for those that may not know about your group, share with us uh, who Kindred Souls is. Kindred Souls is my wife and I. Uh, Becky and I just celebrated our 39th wedding anniversary, and uh, we have our we have our first grandson. His name is Davis, and he is maybe uh, we're still collecting data, but we think he may be the most fabulous child ever born on the face of the earth. <laughs> but uh, then uh, the other two members of Kindred Souls are my little sister Allison and her husband, Shelton, they've been worship pastors for many years, and then they've been traveling with us for um, ugh, 15 years now. Well, it doesn't seem like it's been that long, and the four of us have traveled the world, and, and but, you know, we're, again, we all grew up in church. We all grew up doing this, and, um, and, and seeing people be led into his presence is the 
the cry of our heart and it's our passion and we just absolutely love doing it. I so appreciate uh, your time with me today and the opportunity just to visit and to hear your heart. And uh, we are we so thank God for you and Becky and your ministry and your credible music over the years. And uh, my prayer for you and your family and your ministry is that your best days of music and writing are still yet to come. Thank you, Jeb. I appreciate that. And I appreciate so much what you do and the ministry of uh, Second Baptist there in Houston. The first time I became really aware of, uh, of Second Baptist was when Holy Ground was still a fairly new song. It had been out a little while and, um, and it was nominated for Song of the Year at the Dove Awards. And at the ASCAP luncheon, um, a publishing mate of mine who um, we had gotten to be good friends. We were signed to the same publisher the same week and I uh, had just gotten to know one another. Michael W. Smith comes up to me and he goes, Jaron, I just want to let you know that song is everywhere. He said, I've never been asked to sing a song at my concerts to open a concert of mine with a song that wasn't mine until recently. And I was doing a concert at Second Baptist Church in Houston, and they told me, oh, by the way, we open every service right. with Holy Ground, and right. you'll have to sing it. And he said, so I sat at the piano and sang Holy Ground with the choir and everybody else. and opened it. So he said, I just want to tell you, your song's everywhere, and That's it's great. So I, I, I became aware of you guys. Um, a long time ago, and I've been very grateful that uh, you guys were singing my music. Then it was great to get to be friends with you and, I, and to know what you're doing. Thank you so much for what you guys do for the kingdom.